Most mental health conditions should be treated with psychological interventions first. This is also true for children and young people with an intellectual disability. The exception to this is those conditions that are more severe and handicapping, that the person with developmental disability and mental health disorder is unable to engage effectively with behavioural or psychological intervention. Conversely, cases that require pharmacology usually also need psychological intervention or should do so when they gain sufficient benefit from the pharmacology to enable other approaches of treatment. The other consideration is whether there are sufficient sources, resources to provide adequate care. There are, however, several mental health conditions in which prescription of psychotropic medications might be appropriate as a first or second line treatment. There is an especially well-established role for pharmacology for a range of severe conditions, including ADHD, major depression, severe anxiety, obsessional compulsive disorder, mania, and schizophrenia. Cases where a child with intellectual disability and co-occurring mental disorder can be treated with psychological interventions include mild to moderate ADHD, anxiety and depression. These should be treated with behaviour therapy and cognitive behaviour therapy. But there are also other treatments such as mindfulness and dialectical behaviour therapy that are gaining recognition in this population. Often behavioural and cognitive behavioural therapy has to be adapted to include in addition the positive psychology approaches of building self-care skills, augmentative and alternative communication, emotional understanding, theory of mind and sensory physical training. The most common case that I see where a child with an intellectual disability and co-occurring mental disorder is treated with a psychotropic medication is autism, ADHD and anxiety and often the mainstream treatments for ADHD and anxiety aren't as effective as in mainstream populations. Treating ADHD with stimulants can make the anxiety and stereotypic rigidity, rigidity worse and treating Anxiety with an SSRI can make ADHD much worse. So such treatment trials have to be approached with real caution for the side effects. There are also some medications that have a greater role in younger people, in young people with intellectual disability than in a neurotypical population because of the problems of side effects and comorbidities. And this includes clonidine, amitriptyline and tricyclics, and mood stabilizers. Some key issues to consider when prescribing psychotropic medication to a child with an intellectual disability are, one, keep medication safe from children and those with impulsive or suicidal risk. Two, start low, go slow, consider age and size, and sensitivity to medications. Three, warn of frequent and severe side effects. It's also helpful to provide standard information sheets on the medication and possible side effects. Four, ensure the patient or parent has ready telephone or email access to you or your team in case they are concerned about effects or side effects. Five, only make one change at a time. If you withdraw a drug at the same time as adding one, you don't know which drug is responsible for the effect. Six, patients with intellectual disability or other neurodevelopmental problems have greater rates of side effects or lower rates of therapeutic success. But the severity of their problems often mean that alternative approaches may be limited and a failure to treat has huge impacts. Accordingly, 
their need for medication treatments in order to continue a normalized lifestyle are greater. Although a clinician knows what drugs can be helpful, it is only by trialing a medication that one can learn what effect this medication will have in this patient. Accordingly, informed consent involves a trial of treatment. 8. Although a single medication is preferred to treat a condition, it is not uncommon for two or more medications to be needed to treat different conditions or symptoms. One needs to be aware of the potential for drug interactions, but drugs often also work to provide additive benefit. 9. It's important to define an agreed target of treatment and have a means of measuring its change over time, such as frequency, severity and duration of aggression, or the severity of low mood or other vegetative symptoms. Often, in severe mental illness, it's important to understand what are the early signs of deterioration, such as the onset of sleep disturbance, and to look to this target symptom to prevent a major relapse. The safety of medication is generally well established, but needs to be monitored within the bounds of what risks they hold. Conversely, just because a non-pharmacological treatment or diet is described as natural, that does not mean that they are necessarily safe. Indeed, much harm can be done by alternative therapists providing false hope, especially to the desperate, whose often unproven treatment may be costly. Evidence-based approaches to treatment is the best way to help a young person with intellectual disability. 11. Although major tranquilizers are often used in severe mental disorders, apart from in psychosis, they are seldom the first-line treatment. Most major tranquilizers have long-term risks of obesity and the cardiometabolic syndrome, and these need regular monitoring and attention to the importance of a healthy lifestyle. Twelve, it is important to negotiate the withdrawal and change of medications with your doctor. But it's also important to know when and how to test whether one still needs a medication. It's important to have a GP or coordinating doctor to monitor medications that may be needed in the longer term. 13. Chronic or recurrent aggression is not treatable with pharmacology. Pharmacology is appropriately used to treat an associated mental disorder which may contribute to predisposing aggression.